All right, so my job, I think, is to ease you into the morning. And I think I'm the perfect speaker to do that because I'm sort of like light on network theory, light on network methods, and light on data uh, compared to all the rest of the speakers that will follow. So I'll just sort of like ease you into to the rest of the workshop. Um, but I want to do that by starting with a proverb. Um, it's probably an Irish proverb. Um, and it says, um, listen attentively to others, and in the end you will be counted among the wise. So I think that's a nice proverb to sort of tie in what I want to discuss today, which is about the role of attention in networks. And rather than walk through this in kind of a typical paper fashion, I'm going to walk you through it in a little more of a discovery mode. So how Luke, who's my, my co-author and I, ended up kind of arriving at this decision that we wanted to try to understand the role that paying attention to information in networks might play um, when we talk about innovation. Okay, so you know this is a slide that probably many of us end up having, or some version of this slide we end up having in our classes, whether it's MBA students, master's students, PhD students at some point, where we talk about innovation in networks. And there's been you know, decades worth of work now uh, by many of the scholars in this room thinking about how do, we, how do networks factor into innovation within and across companies. And the prevailing wisdom seems to be something like this, right? I don't see anybody nodding in disagreement, that we end up being able to generate ideas better when we are connected to a number of alters who are not connected to each other. That that diversity in our networks and the diversity in the ties of our alters allows us access to different pockets of information that we can usefully combine into novel sources of, of ideas. We can move problems from one domain, um, we can move solutions from one domain into problems from another. And that this sort of network diversity is, is a very good thing for generating ideas. But generating ideas is not the only thing that makes implementations work. People also have to buy into them and use them and make sense out of them. And there's different network configurations that seem to be more optimal at helping for implementation purposes. These more dense, closely tied networks, like the one on the right, tend to be much better at doing that sort of job because they facilitate trust. Um, uh, a number of folks in this room, like Brian, for example, right, have talked about the paradox of these two different kinds of networks in action, that they let us do certain things up to a point and less at another. Um, and this is sort of a, a de facto slide that I've seen a number of times, lots of places. And this was a, a, a discussion that we had in a PhD, PhD seminar that I taught a number of years ago about is this the way that ideas get generated in networks and is this the way that ideas get implemented? In networks and as you might imagine in many classes like you've taught there is lively discussion about the evidence that might back up these claims. Ambush? Um, this, is, this is my first time so I'm, yeah. uh, I'm not sure what is the format of this workshop but, but is this really true? I mean is this I mean I would have thought that it was the other way around that you want a much more loosely structured network in order to generate ideas and you want some kind of a top-down structure to implement the specific idea. So are you saying that this is this is the truth or are you, are you going to argue on this? Of course it's the truth. <laughs> Here, exclamation mark. I would suggest that there's quite a bit of evidence right in the literature in sociology and the social sciences backing up this point and I'll get into the logic in just a second about why the evidence is here and I think that part of the reason that this sort of conceptualization of network structure maps onto ideas of innovation is in large part tied to the way that people have defined innovation. And I think probably the most popular way that folks have defined innovation is that innovations arise based on recombination of existing information. And if you take that view that innovation is not something that arises right de novo but is something that takes other pieces of information that already exist and brings them together and that's your sort of core definition of how innovation arises, it makes sense that a network structure of the type on the left here would be good at doing that because it provides you access into many different areas for you to see lots of different ways of doing things and then be able to make those kinds of combinations that will hopefully result in new process improvements or new products or those sorts of things. Um, so I think that's why you get this sort of hub and spoke network. But the, the important feature of this, of course, is not just that you have a central, a central actor, I've just stylized it here, of course, right? 
but that you're connected with altars that are not connected to each other. So every distinct community that you reach out to is providing you, presumably, with some different amount or different kind of information. Um, and so you're not talking to all four or five of your, your altars and receiving very similar or redundant information. So that's, I think, how, what the, how, the, how the theory would explain it. And again, the important point here that I really want to highlight that's going to undergird a lot of what I discuss um, in the next, next several minutes is that this idea that innovation arises from the recombination of these existing elements is really crucial to understanding, I think, why theory has developed that supports these sorts of modes of where idea generation at least comes from. I can't do a presentation without telling you that I've talked to people, because that's my favorite part of the job. Um, and this is a, a manager that I talked with um, in a big software company. Um, and we, we were doing an interview um, about a related topic, and he sort of spontaneously started to discuss networks and the idea of building networks. And this is what he said. You know, everybody talks about networks these days. I've got a big network. He's pretty proud of that. I know tons of people. I talk to a lot of people on a regular basis. I'm really good at keeping in touch um, and doing what it takes to nurture a relationship so I can use it if I need it. But I don't have time to pay attention to all these folks. I'm way too busy. Out of the like 100 plus people that I talk to normally, maybe I really pay attention to 10 of them, if that. So think about that in relationship to the proverb that I told you just a minute ago. Proverb would suggest that this person may not, in the end, be wise, because although he has many, many different communication partners and lots of inflow of information, he's not listening attentively to the information that's coming from them. And one of the things that struck Luke and I as we were thinking about these ideas of network structure and innovation was that there's often an implicit assumption, and, all, and sometimes it's quite explicit, in papers that look at innovation and networks. And that assumption is that if you have a tie with someone, right, or a connection with someone, the information that you receive is information that you're going to be paying attention to. But that manager that we just talked with, and I can give you many other quotes that look just like that, suggests that we have many more ties than we have the attentional capacity to listen to. And this is something that has been talked about in the cognitive and behavioral sciences, at least since Herb Simon's work, right, in the 1940s. Um, that we are, of course, limited in our ability to process information. And so we're going to always have many more relationships than we can attend to in any real depth. And so you can imagine a scenario uh, like the one here where I'm receiving information from other people, right? Information sort of coming across the transom. But how am I paying attention at all to that information that's coming in? One, one way that you might think about it would be, well, I'm, I'm hearing what people are saying. I'm aware that people are giving me information or that I'm receiving information from a source, but I'm not actually attending to that information in any real sort of way. Okay? So there may be no arrow going back to one of these in terms of attention. Um, Kahneman, in the 70s, made a very interesting distinction when thinking about information processing. One that, you know, he's obviously advanced quite a bit into um, his, his latest ideas of sort of thinking fast and slow. But what Kahneman argued was there's two kind of fundamental ways that we process information and pay attention in particular to information. And one is what he called a divided information processing function. And divided information looks something like this, that I've got multiple inputs, and what I do as someone who's attending in the world, is I divide my attentional capacity roughly equally across the different, different information inputs. Okay, so the idea here, of course, being that I'm making sure to pay attention a little bit to everybody, but because my processing is only sort of you know, this deep, um, I'm only hearing a little bit about what everybody's saying. Okay? Um, and one of the examples that's used quite popularly in the literature to talk about divided attention is airplane pilots. That there are so many controls in an airplane cockpit that pilots are simultaneously dividing their attention across as many information inputs as they can. And if you read you know, NTSB um, reports of pilot error, it's often that there was an indicator going on, but the pilot wasn't paying enough attention to that particular indicator. And part of the problem is that there are so much, so much information being thrust at a pilot in the cockpit that 
how we decide to pay attention is a really tricky issue. And so pilots are often trained to divide their attention to so that they have a handle as close as they can on all the various information inputs that are being thrown at them. So that's an example of divided attention. A second route of processing information is what's often called focused attention or selective attention. And the idea here is that I have a number of different information inputs, but I decide to asymmetrically distribute the amount of attention I have to those resources. So some people may receive a lot of my processing power, while information coming from other ties may receive a very small portion of my processing power. Um, I won't show it here because I assume most of you have seen it, but um, if you're familiar with the invisible gorilla experiment, can I see a show of hands of how many people know that? Okay, most people in the room. So I won't explain it in too much depth, but it's a great little experiment um, done by some researchers at the University of Illinois that have um, asked you to pay really close attention to a, a team of students that are passing a basketball. And you're asked to count how many times they pass the basketball. And as the basketball passing is going on, uh, a person in a gorilla suit walks through the middle. And what the authors argue is that in about only, uh, approximately only 60% of instances, people notice the gorilla going by, right? In the remaining instances, they're blind to the gorilla. And when I saw this for the first time, I didn't know there was a gorilla there at all. I was so intent on counting the passes, going back and forth, I think 15 is the number or something at the end, um, that the authors argue that, um, that uh, subjects experience what they call inattentional blindness that by selectively focusing their attention so much on one aspect, one salient aspect of the information environment, that they're purpose purposefully paying less attention to other aspects of the information environment, like gorillas passing through. So we've tried to represent that here in this very basic diagram of saying, I've got these two ties, and I'm paying the bulk of my attention to one of those ties and not to another, so the amount of processing power that I'm giving towards receiving that information is distributed in an asymmetric fashion. Okay, so if we go back to, to this slide that I presented to you before, um, I want you to indulge me in a thought experiment for just a second. So let's imagine for, for a moment that I'm going to, I'm the actor in the middle here with this blue node, and I'm gonna divide my attention equally across all of my information inputs. What would that look like? So, in this chart here, all the red nodes are folks that I'm paying attention to. Now, imagine that I've got, let's say, um, six units of attentional capacity. Again, this is a thought experiment, so I apologize for the simplicity, but let's say I've got six units of attentional capacity, and I'm dividing those six units equally across all of my ties. That means that I'm distributing approximately you know, one unit of informational capacity, attention processing capability, to every one of my ties. Okay, so I'm distributing it equally, at least on the, the sociogram on the left here. So what does that mean? Can I process information very deeply from any one of these contacts? No, what I'm likely to get is very surface level information or high level information from each one of those contacts because I'm not able to devote the time and care to really trying to understand the nuances of what they describe. That would be the situation whether I was in a network that looks like the one on the left or the one on the right. The difference, though, is that if I'm in a network like the one on the left, right, this network that we typically say is good for idea generation, what that means is that I'm getting a little bit of information on how this group operates, how this group operates, and this group operates. And that very high-level information may be enough for me to see important differences that allow for some kind of recombination. But if I'm in the network on the right and I'm dividing my attention equally and only getting a superficial bit of information, what the theory would, what theories would suggest is that I'm most likely to hear the same thing from the same people over and over and over again. And there have been a number of studies about well, what, kinds of, what kinds of information do people present when there's a very limited amount of time, and they tend to present the things that they think are the easiest to explain or the highest level. And so I'm likely in the network on the right to hear very the same very superficial high level things from the majority of the people that I talk with. So what, what does all this mean in this thought experiment? What Luke and I suggest is that that divided attention 
that is processing information at a very shallow level probably works out just fine in a network characterized by reach and non-redundancy amongst my contacts. Because the difference in that shallow information is probably sufficient for me to be able to understand a little bit about what's going on in each of those different worlds and make some kind of useful recombination of it. But in a very dense network where information that moves across the network is highly redundant, I'm not getting much advantage by diluting my, my attention or dividing my attention across all of these different alters because I'm hearing the same basic thing over and over again. And what's worse, I'm hearing, hearing at it at such a high level that I'm probably not likely to make much sense out of it. So again, these are very idealized pictures of a network, but I'm just trying to kind of indulge us in this, this thought experiment for a second. So imagine that we, instead of dividing our attention, followed that second path described by Kahneman. And instead of s distributing my attention symmetrically across all the information inputs, I focused that information asymmetrically on a few number of people. So if you take a look at the way that this is stylized in this graph, you'll see that the red nodes again represent folks that I'm paying attention to, and the black nodes are people that I'm simply talking to or receiving information from, but not really attending to it in any, any depth. And what we would see here would be quite an opposite pattern, that there might be severe disadvantages from doing that in a very sparse network connecting non-redundant alters because now the breadth of information that I'm receiving is not very deep. But in the dense network on the right, now I'm really able to dive into specific details and lots of depth and information that might allow me to capture some nuance from the depth of the information gathering in which I've been participating. The reason that we think this might be the case is that over the last couple years, there's been quite a bit of research amongst network scholars um, and scholars of tie strength more broadly in kind of thinking about what advantage do strong ties have, not just for the ability to facilitate trust and um, implementation, but to actually develop new knowledge and information. Um, Sanan Aral and Marshall Van Alstine <clears throat> talked about this trade-off between diversity and bandwidth, and that as you have more sort of more band more diversity, the bandwidth of any one of those ties begins to shrink. And they show, I think, some pretty compelling empirical evidence that ideas can arise out of very high bandwidth channels. Right? because people are able to really focus deeply on information and try to understand it at, at a very profound level. Uh, Manuel Sosa at INSEAD has also sort of talked about how creative interactions generate from strong ties. Um, Sarah Kaplan and colleagues have, have thought about local versus distant recombination, so combining very, recombining very local and similar pieces of information as opposed to distant, diverse information that you would get in search in more diverse networks. And what the data seem to be suggesting is that there are instances in very high bandwidth kinds of relationships where the, the depth and profundity of the information being presented allows us to really understand some matter in a complex way to be able to generate new ideas about it. That it, if I was just focusing at a very surface level, hoping to grab a little bit from here and a little bit from there and recombine it, I might miss that important nuance. And that research is backed up in, in a number of studies in social psychology that talk about the importance of persistence um, for creativity. That working at the same problem in a very deep fashion over and over for a long period of time, as you accumulate more and more deep information about that problem, allows people to overcome some of the key, um, uh, the sort of the key antipathies in an area or the overcome some of the real puzzling points that have been vexing a team of researchers and it's from really diving deep and hearing multiple perspectives on a very 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 narrow set of topics and from a very narrow set of expertise that allows you to build up the competency to, to innovate in that way and our argument here is that these two, these two different ways of sort of allocating attention one dividing attention very broadly and two focusing attention on a very specific set of individuals who are sharing deep amounts of information are likely to represent two different pathways to idea generation. 
So that first pathway is really um, information, so the redundancy of information via a sparse network or a network that's connecting um, alters that aren't already connected. Um, and I tried to pick just some popular examples here to sort of illustrate this. Um, Steve Jobs has this great quote that would support a lot of what uh, network scholars have said about innovation, that creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they really didn't do it. Right? So this is the idea, again, that we've got a diverse, um, a diverse array of information that I have access to and that I process. And that the mechanism that's going to allow me to, to really process, to take advantage of that diversity is that I'm hoping to recombine those different pieces of information into something new. Thomas Edison is known for the quote about perspiration, right? And says that our greatest weakness lies in giving up. And the most certain way to succeed is to try just one more time. Um, again, just a, a very generic kind of quote and example here, but the idea being that the more we focus and pay deep attention in a particular topic area, the more and the more we interrogate a problem by hearing relevant information to it, perhaps from, from several viewpoints, the more likely we are to be able to process that information in a really deep way. Okay, so maybe I'll pause here to ask if the logic that I've tried to develop makes sense so far, or if there's questions about it. Yeah, Jenna. Would you say that people use both and switch between them? Or are you saying that people have a sort of a general tendency to do one or the other? It's mm -hmm. a great question. Um, my guess would be people can people do do both and switch between them. What we're gonna look at, and I think I'll just show the hypothesis the hypotheses here because I think they'll help to sort of answer this question, is our argument is that there's probably some kind of optimal matching that might take place between attention processing style or an attention allocation strategy, as we call it, and the kind of network structure in which somebody finds him or herself. And so the idea is this. If we have a network that varies in constraint, and constraint is a measure you know, popularized by Ron Burt that looks at how much any individual ego is connected to alters that talk to one another. So individuals that are in lowly constrained networks span lots of structural holes and have access to non-redundant um, pieces of information while individuals in highly constrained networks tend to be embedded within a group of alters that talk amongst themselves a lot, and so the theory is that there's multiple pieces of similar information floating around that network. So if we take network structure, right, that looks something like this, and we're to sort of array against that different attention allocation strategies, divided attention and focused attention, um, that looks something like this, based on what I've discussed so far, we would expect that people in lowly constrained networks, right, those who are brokers, would do better in terms of generating ideas if they divide attention. And I think the logic for that makes quite a bit of sense, that if the information advantage that's provided by virtue of being a broker at a structural whole is that you have this vision into different communities doing different things, you wanna make sure that you're paying some attention to what's happening in those different communities so you can pull in that diversity of information and make the kinds of recombinations that you want. But if you are focusing your attention on one tie or maybe two ties, you're undermining the structural advantage of that particular network form, right? Because you're connected to all these people that can give you reach into other communities, but you're not taking advantage of that reach. Conversely, um, in networks characterized by high constraints, so individuals that are embedded in a very dense network, we would expect exactly the opposite pattern. That individuals who are dividing their attention across all of their information inputs are probably less likely to be able to, to innovate because that information is redundant. But if they focus deeply, really trying to understand the complexity of information coming from one or two people, for example, that their ability to generate ideas, good ideas, would probably increase, but it happens via a different mechanism, right? a different pathway. And that pathway is that they're deeply interrogating that information rather than trying to do some amount of recombination. Yeah? But the ability of a particular person to do so will depend on what strategies provided or focused attention their alters are following. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a network that has a very constrained network, I'm going to focus my attention on what strategies are being used to get me to do something. Mm -hmm. And if I'm in a network that has a very constrained network, 
attention, but all of my alters are for some reason using divided attention because their networks are a little different or because they have different objectives from me, then I don't really have any access to that folk, those, those focused ideas. Even if I try, everyone's just giving me shallow information about what other people are doing. So wouldn't there be a very game theoretic aspect to it that one would have to address beyond just the um, structure of the network? Yeah, that's a good question. I hadn't quite thought about it in that, that frame before. Um, but yes, I suppose there would be. Um, our assumption, kind of going into this, is that if I have access to information and at the broadest brush, right, I kind of understand a little bit about what this person does and that person does, but it's, but it's very broad. And what, I'm, what I really want to do is to understand more uh, that information in a much deeper way, right, and understand the complexity of that information, then there are steps that I could take to try to do that, right? And some of those steps, you know, would include um, buttering you up in some way, right? So that you want to spend time talking with me. I'm engaging in some sort of uh, reciprocal exchange, right? So that I'm providing something to you that you need. So you'll be able to sit down and give me more information. Um, what, what theorists who have looked at implementation, right, in those much denser cliques of the network have argued is that people are more likely to listen to one another because there's a fair amount of trust and also a common language that already exists that makes it easier for us to discuss. And our thought is that those same properties, right, trust, common language, common framing, are things that would probably make an alter a little bit more likely to say yes or agree to my request to ask you for more deep information on a very particular topic because you're already known to me and we've got um, you know, we've got other alters in common that perhaps I would disappoint if I didn't give you access to the information that I wanted. So that's kind of the way that we were thinking about it. But, but I agree that sort of thinking about the matching between um, preferences amongst alters for whether they are also enacting differentiation or di division versus focus strategies would be an interesting way to think about it. Scott? You know, it, it's, uh, you also wonder about the properties of the number. You know, it kind of reminds me of the hedgehog and the fox. Berlin's idea that some people would prefer to do deep thinking. You know, that's just the way they've cultivated in their lives, whereas others are so much more scattered. Right. That problem would make a difference too, right? Yeah, that's a good a good question. I wonder if there are good kinds of measures for assessing that. I don't know of any off the top of my head, but do you? Well there's not a hedge on fox measure, but there yeah. are <laughs> hmm, okay. Yes. Model taking into consideration of the effect on time and self selection. So, my um, idea is like so when you're being put in a new context, when you have very little knowledge about you know, all the surrounding actors, you're more likely to divide your attention equally among all others. But over time, you will discover some authors are really smart and they have really good uh, information, things like that. You will become more focused. So that doesn't necessarily mean over time you will have less food ideas. It's just like you know where to pay your attention to. Mm -hmm. Does that also be taken care of like, in the model? Yeah, that, that's a great question. No, it's not taken care of in the model. This is cross-sectional data. Um, but this is an area that we sort of talk about in the paper as an area for future work, right? That as, exactly as you described it, right? As you get to know, um, let's call it the sort of information landscape of your context better, you have a more fine-tuned sense of where where is the investment most likely to pay off in terms of paying attention, right? Um, and we just can't get at that in this particular data. Connie? Um, so uh, in organizational learning literature, they talk about the difference between exploration mm -hmm. versus exploitation. So I just wonder how your framework connect to that, you know, exploration versus exploitation. Are they similar, different? In what ways are they similar, different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I think that the very first model that I put up there that showed the very sparse network and the very dense network, right? And the very sparse network, I said, evidence suggests that this is um, perhaps leads to more good ideas. Um, I think that, that comparison there lines up with exploration versus exploitation in some way, right? That the, the way that most literature on innovation and networks would sort of think about it is that 
the, the exploratory work happens in this very diverse network where you're pulling in multiple information inputs and then exploitation or the way that we implement and create value out of those ideas happens more easily in the dense network. What we're trying to do is to say, the, if we've, the way that we've thought about innovation is that the modes of innovation, if you think of idea generation and idea implementation as two different modes of innovation, if what the traditional sort of the popular approach is to say that idea generation happens in these very sparse networks and idea implementation happens through density of ties, our question is, could idea generation also happen in situations where the network is very dense and all egos are connected to alters that already talk to one another a lot? So what we're trying to, to do is to sort of cleave the idea that certain networks are better for different kinds of activities around innovation, right, idea generation or idea implementation. And instead, if people are in either more dense or sparser networks or networks with higher or lower levels of constraint, could both of those situations result in the ability to generate good ideas dependent on how people are allocating their attention to alters? That makes sense? Focus of attention, you know, kind of, you know, I'm trying to figure out the difference between focus of attention versus exploitation, and then divided attention with exploration. So that's mm -hmm. like, you know, the differences and, you know, similarities between your framework and Okay, well maybe we can talk about it a little more yeah, at the okay. end to get your question. Uh -huh. uh, we'll take one more and then I'll move on. Uh, well, this is like a slightly related question, but less on like the pathway to get there and, yeah. and the outcome. And I'm wondering if the good ideas that you get in each of these quadrants are the same kind of good ideas. You know, are, or are one set of good ideas good because they're more exploratory, you know, and, and, and trying out new things versus the other is ex more exploitative ideas that are more efficiency generating. Mm -hmm. Or are they really two pathways that get you to the same thing or two pathways that lead you to different places? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll hope to partially answer that through uh, results of a content analysis that I'll show you in a couple minutes. Um, but that gets right to sort of the core of what, what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so um, what we did to try to explore, so really, these are the two hypotheses. Really, they're, they're one hypothesis, right? It's, it's one hypothesis. Um, that the more constraint that you have in your network, um, the more dividing attention across all of your alters will lead to lower levels of idea generation. And then the less constraint you have in your network, the better off you are dividing your attention across your alters. Okay, that's the, the basic hypothesis. Um, so we collected data at a, um, a software company in South Korea, um, and we were lucky enough to sort of have a whole network of all the engineers in the company's R&D center. Um, and these engineers are software engineers that are developing a mobile application um, for sort of a game, mobile gaming application that's an SMS application. Um, and we were able to collect uh, quite a bit of archival data about um, job performance and um, demographic information and those kinds of things, and conducted a number of interviews with, um, with those engineers and senior VPs at the company to really try to understand what is the sort of normal process of software development look like, what's the, the way that engineers build and form relationships across R&D. And then we um, implemented a, a sociometric survey to understand what their social networks look like and also um, implemented an attention scale that I'll talk about in a second. So in terms of the network survey, um, what we aimed to do was to basically replicate the methodology that Ron Burt used in his um, 2004 AJS paper on um, structural holes and good ideas. And the methodology was pretty simple and the reason that we wanted to replicate it was because it shows a very strong main effect between idea uh, structural holes, position of the structural hole, and likelihood of generating good ideas. Um, and what we're essentially arguing in our hypothesis is for a moderation effect, right, of attention allocation. And so we thought that what we would do would be to, to basically replicate the study and look for the same main effect, and then to see what happens when we add in our attention allocation variables as moderators. So um, the first step of the network survey is a name generator where we're asking them to um, 
or an idea generator where we're asking them to describe an idea that they have um, during the past year to improve software development or operation processes at the company and those are terms that are very meaningful for R&D and again this is a replication of what Bert did and then the second step was the network or the name generator where we asked them to to give us names of people with whom they've discussed the, the idea that they proposed um, and then the third part then was measuring their attention to network ties and this was the most complicated part because there are no measures of attention to networks. And so what we what we did was we start we looked in the literature for definitions of attention and we ended up um, focusing on one uh, used by Willie Ocasio who draws on a lot of cognitive and social psychological research on attention um, that defines it as noticing, encoding, interpreting, and focusing. And so what we did um, in order to generate um, a set of measures was we created questions and then we pre-tested them on a separate, a separate sample um, and ran a confirmatory factor analysis um, and really were able to come up with these questions that focused on these different dimensions of attention. And so our variable for attention is basically an average of the scores on all four of these different questions. Okay. Um, so here's what the, the the model looks like. We started off with a, um, a model of network constraint, right, which is really the extent to which a, an ego uh, talks to alters and the extent to which those alters are already connected with one another. And then we looked at attention allocation and we decided to use the Herfindel score, Herfindel index, um, to measure attention. And the reason that we decided to use this, we, we tried a number of different measures. Um, and they all produced relatively similar, um, similar findings. But the Herfindel one, I think, theoretically made the most sense because it's used quite a bit in the literature on diversity and categorization within strategy and is trying to look at uh, the degree to which a firm allocates resources in its portfolio right, across multiple areas of the portfolio or directs resources to a particular piece of the portfolio. And so that same Herfindel score could, is useful in sort of thinking about attention as either divided attention or focused attention. And then the last sort of variable in the model was goodness of, an, goodness of ideas. And we followed the exact same procedure that Bert did, where we asked the, the senior VPs in the organization to rate the ideas on a scale of 0 to 10 um, about how how effective they thought this idea would be in improving processes at the company. So it's a, a subjective rating right, by these two VPs, and we averaged their scores together. Okay, so again, that's kind of just following Bert's measure. So the model looks something like this. Bert's model and the main effect suggests that there should be a negative relationship between network constraint and goodness of ideas, such that the lower your network constraint, meaning the more that you broker across different groups, the higher the likelihood of generating a good idea is. And we're adding in this moderator, which is attention allocation, and we're suggesting, of course, that if you are in a, a, high, a low constraint network, right, so one that's characterized by a lot of information diversity, that your likelihood of generating good ideas will increase if you divide attention equally across those alters, and will decrease if you focus your attention specifically on, um, on a few of those alters. Okay, so the model um, looks something like this. And really our key, sort of the key relationship that we're looking to test is the interaction effect between network constraint and attention allocation. Okay. Um, here's the full model. Um, what I'll just show you that I think is interesting is that firm tenure in all the, in all the models is negatively uh, correlated with attention. Or sorry, negatively correlated with good ideas. So the longer someone has been at the company um, regardless of the model that we test here, the less likely they are to generate an idea that senior management thinks is going to really improve the company. Um, but I'm just going to zoom in on this part of the model <laughs> that looks at, main, looks at our effects here. So the, the first um, in the, the red box on the upper left is really the replication of BERT's finding. And we show a very strong main effect, the exact same way that BERT did, that network constraint uh, predicts idea goodness. Um, if I can use that phrase, um, and that the lower your network constraint, the more likely you are to come up with a good idea. When we add in our interaction effect, we find that there's also a significant effect there, our interaction variable. So individuals who, who are in 
highly constrained networks, so those that are in really dense part of the networks, come up with better ideas if they are focusing their attention on a few specific alters and do worse if they're dividing their attention across all their alters. And the converse is true for folks that have a, um, a lowly constrained network so that they are talking to many others who do not talk to each other and they're um, dividing their attention, the likelihood of generating a good idea goes up. And to show you the crossover um, moderation, um, what you'll notice here is if you look at the, um, this chart, that one standard deviation above the sort of normal, the mean attention allocation scores within the group um, really represents divided attention. And the lower your network constraint, the more likely you are to produce a good idea. And the higher your network constraint, sort of the better off you are if you have focused attention. And then what we tried to do to sort of further probe this is we did a, a, a split sample analysis. And we looked at folks that have low constraint and high constraint scores. And this is my favorite chart. Um, this is the one that gets us into the most trouble, I think, but it's my favorite one. Um, in that what, what we do here is we compare different strategies of attention allocation on this split sample. And so if you look at the red line that runs through low constraint, um, what you see is that if someone has a network constraint of 0.2, which is quite low, um, then here's kind of the mean that if you're one standard deviation above the mean, meaning that what you're doing is you're dividing your attention more than the mean across all of your alters, your likelihood of uh, proposing a good idea or proposing an idea that the senior VPs think is good goes up. And if you start to divide your attention, it goes down. Not surprising, that corresponds with what I told you on the last slide. But if you look here at the high network constraint condition, this is where I think things are very optimistic. And the reason I think they're optimistic is that um, you see there's not, not the kind of um, slopes that you see here, but that if you, are, if you have um, high network constraint and you decide that rather than trying to divide my attention across alters, I'm really going to focus my attention on a select number of people, the likelihood shoots way up right, that I'll be able to produce an idea that's rated as good by senior management. And the, the reason to do this comparison is to show that if someone has a network constraint of 0.2, which in theories of network and innovation would suggest that they're in an optimal position, right, to really be able to generate good ideas, you can see that someone who has an almost completely constrained network can surpass, right, this is 0.3, this is 0.25 here, can surpass their level of idea generation, not by changing their network in any way, but by changing the way they allocate their attention to information. So why I think this is a really hopeful and optimistic finding is, it seems to me, and I tried to look for some empirical evidence to back this claim up, but I couldn't find any, but it seems to me that it's much more difficult to change your network than it is to change the way you pay attention, right? Because you don't own your network. You have to reconfigure relationships with other people in order to shift a network. And so if our theories tell us that what is going to put you in the best position to generate ideas is having a network that looks very different than what your network currently looks like, you might be in a, in a boatload of trouble. But what these findings suggest is that you might, might be able to improve your odds at at least generating ideas that are as good as the ideas generated by people in lowly constrained networks simply by shifting the way that we pay attention. This might also help to explain some amount of variance in models that show, well, why is it that not all people who are in these brokerage positions end up being able to generate good ideas? Um, there's been quite a bit of work into what, what are the correlates that get people in, maybe into these positions in the first place. Um, but what this would suggest is that you could be systematically undermining the structural advantage that your network gives you by paying attention in ways that are misaligned with how information is coming at you. So to get to the content analysis, I promised you really quickly, and then I'll end for some questions. Um, what we decided to do was to look at the content of those ideas that people generated. Um, and so on the one hand, we've got people that generated, people in sort of the low constraint networks, right, that are spanning structural holes, and the other side, very um, dense spots of the network. And we looked at the, the different kinds of ideas that they generated. 
And we picked um, 42 ideas out of the corpus of ideas that were generated. Um, and we picked these 42 because they all had scores of six or above. So they were generally considered good ideas by the senior VP. And we analyzed these. We had some, um, some graduate students that analyzed the coding of these to try to code for whether or not the ideas in, that were generated by people in the low constraint conditions were, had evidence of them pulling multiple sources of information together. In other words, doing recombination. Because the theoretical mechanism that I proposed at the beginning of this talk was that in the, the condition of network, um, low network constraint, people are generating ideas by virtue of recombination. But in the case of high network constraint, they're generating ideas by virtue of interrogation. We couldn't directly test that mechanism. And so what we're doing is the content analysis to try to show whether there might be some empirical support for that. And what we find is, you can see here, 20 out of 23 of the ideas from the low constraint condition were coded as being cross-domain. So people bringing in information from multiple viewpoints. And 14 out of 19 of those ideas that were generated in the high constraint condition were coded as being domain specific. So really focusing quite deeply on a specific topic area and trying to understand that topic area in its fullness of complexity rather than trying to bring in other elements from the outset. So I think what our findings hopefully can, will, will do is be debatable, number one, as I think all good findings should be, um, but begin to, to spur a little bit more of a conversation about the role of attention in networks. Um, I'm pretty convinced that what the findings show is that attention allocation matters, that it matters for the way that we process information, um, and that what we are starting to uh, uncover or identify is a fit between attention allocation strategies and network structure such that we could maybe even, with more studies that would support the kinds of findings we have here, begin to make some normative claims for if you have a network of a particular type and you want to improve the odds that you can generate good ideas, here is what you might be able to do in order to do that. Um, I think at a more a broader theoretical level, what we're trying to do is to suggest that these kinds of dense networks um, that are characterized by lots of information redundancy don't need to just serve the purpose of being good at helping you to implement ideas. But in fact, they might be a second avenue through which idea generation can occur if attention is allocated in the right kinds of ways. Um, and as we think about the sort of current state of information and networks and processing, we're not in a world of information scarcity at all, right? We're in a world of attention scarcity. And so as we think about the much larger data sources that most of you will be talking about today rather than my meager sample of 120 people. Um, how we think about paying attention to the potential information that's coming in from all of those different edges really matters. And as we think about our networks increasing in social media and those kinds of tools, how do we make decisions about where we pay attention? And my hope is that our study might give us a glimpse of, of, some, of a roadmap of how we might think about paying attention. Um, so I think I'll end there. Thank you. We have a number of questions. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I think it's really interesting, and I totally understand why you know, if you have this open network, then focusing undermines the advantage that you get, and vice versa, yeah. you have to close network. But um, in your favorite graph, you also showed that having focused attention in the open network is not as good as having focused attention in the closed network. And I'm wondering if you have some ideas about the theory for that, because it seems like in both cases, like you're totally focused, you're sort of getting all the information from one person mm -hmm. in either case. So why is it better for that one person to be from a closed? Yeah, it's a great question. So my intuition behind this is as follows, that if you are paying attention to multiple multiple alters, right? Let's say it's a small number of, of alters, right? In the highly constrained network, or sorry, the, the low constraint network, so it's the open network, then you're still likely speaking languages of multiple communities. And so your ability to really focus, to, to really get the nuance is hampered by the fact that you have been diverting your perspective 
to not be able to fully comprehend that information. The other thing is that what we find, and I didn't go into this, that sort of the average in the focused condition, the average number of alters that people focused on was like 2.2. Um, and the average network size was about 5.5, I think. And so what that's suggesting is that they're hearing perhaps very similar kinds of information from two different people. So while the information may be the same, the perspectives and the approaches on that information may have enough variance in them that I'm able to hear something a little bit different in what, how, the way that Janet characterizes this problem from the way that Kyle characterizes this problem. And it's by paying attention to that difference or focusing on that difference that allows me to see the problem in a new way. If I'm also focusing on, let's say, two alters, but I'm in the open network, I'm getting two very different sets of information from two very different people, and so I'm not seeing kind of some of the differences and nuance on that same information. Um, that's, I think, most of the intuition what, behind why I think we see that result pan out the way it does. Oh. This is more a comment rather than a question, and it may be my ADHD or it may be just because I'm a man, but I tend not to pay attention to things until after I've already heard about them. You know, so it's not I'm con not consciously paying attention to the world around me, and then somebody will say something like, "Oh, wait, that could be interesting," you know, mm -hmm. and then and then ask them to repeat it. So it kind of <laughs> it, it, it puts the puts the behavior first before the attention. And I don't know if that has implications for this. Or... Um, I think it aligns with what we're sort of predicting here. Is that you know, you attention means that I'm doing a step beyond just hearing, right? And so what. You know, what the broad network, right, that sort of open network will allow you to do is just sort of hear lots of different things. Mm -hmm. And what we see, and I think the, the different, the variance in the main effect, right, of your network position and your likelihood to generate good ideas probably could be explained to a certain degree, I would imagine, by whether you are going back and saying, hey, I thought this was interesting, let me now pay more attention to it. Mm -hmm. And so the degree to which you do that, I think, is likely to affect, you know, how how much we characterize this as attention allocation or not. Okay. Yeah. Michael. Yeah, um, well, yeah so it's a really cool study. Uh, Thank you. I really like it a lot. Um, I have a question about the methodology here. Mm -hmm. And my question really revolves around uh, network degree. But to get to that, let me just make sure I understand something correctly. So um, uh, an arc exists if ego nominates alter. Correct. And it doesn't matter whether alter nominates ego. Um, we did symmetric symmetrize. So these are the edges. These are edges. So they do have to nominate each other, or there's nothing there. So you, who'd you talk to about the idea, and then we confirmed with the other person that they actually listened to that idea. Uh, so, uh, so they have to each. It, it is nominate. It's name generation. Is that right? It's the name generation. So they each have to generate the other's name. Correct. And if it's only one way, there's nothing there. Correct. Okay, that may answer my question, but let me ask it anyway. Okay. Uh, is it is it likely that whether ego nominates Alder is going to be highly correlated with, and maybe even a consequence of whether ego pays attention to Alder? In which case, you're sort of measuring the same thing twice, and divided attention could just be network degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, so we, we thought about this a little bit, and I didn't bring the, the chart to show you, I apologize. But what we tried to do was to look at the correlation between atten the attention measure, <clears throat> attention measure, let me try to say this right. We looked at the attention measure relative to the different ties that people nominated, right? And what we see is that there's quite a bit of variance in whether people are paying attention to their ties at all. So even though I nominated to you, you agreed, when I, we look at when they, when they independently say, how much attention did I pay to Michael, there's no guarantee that that's a high number, right? That in many cases, it's a very low number. So I would surmise one of two things from that. Either they truly are independent constructs, right? And we could do more to test for that, right? their independence. Or you could, I guess, assume that everything is being sopped up by the connection 
and they're inaccurate in their ability to identify whether or not they're paying attention to people. That could be a problem that's occurring in the data. Is that kind of a little bit what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, did you put degree into this analysis? Um, we did in an earlier model. I don't think there was a significant effect from what I recall. No. Sure. So this may be going back to a great presentation that's always more effective. Was by, this may go back to, uh, to Janet's earlier comment or someone's comment about uh, whether both could be the case or not, that you have both. And so no. in particular, and of course your data is cross-sectional and so you have some of those challenges, but I was wondering whether you could speculate uh, based on Ron Burton and Merlusi's uh, piece last year on network oscillation, where the argument was that actually the benefits and network advantage come not from people being in low constraint or high constraint, but people who navigate being in low constraint, then moving into high constraint and coming back into low constraint, etc. So it, it's, that, it's that cycle that they found to be much more predictive of network advantage as compared to stable low constraint or stable high constraint. So how, how would that finding play into future work that you could do to extend this mm -hmm. model? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think that um, that that finding is quite complementary to what we suggest here. Um, and I think it, it perhaps gets back to, I think it was maybe PJ's question before, that let's imagine a scenario in which I have been embedded, right, in a, in a very cohesive network with lots of alters that talk to each other all the time. I have the benefit of being able to understand that world in quite a bit of detail. So that when I'm now in a much, in a brokerage position, sort of at a later point, if I confront some information, if I decided to focus my attention on just a couple of people, maybe I would be in a better position to then be able to, just even with kind of one person, be able to really understand and ask some deep questions about that particular piece of knowledge or the expertise that a person has. Because I understand the context of it, I speak the language of that discipline, and I already, I don't have to scratch the surface. So if I hear something that sounds interesting, I don't spend all of my time in that conversation getting a primer on you know, quantum physics 101, but instead I can skip all that because I've been there and I can now really get to some deep information. If that were the case, I think the way that you would try to deal with that in the models that we showed is that you'd want some kind of network oscillation variable, right? that would be saying, would be predicting, you know, what, what would be the past networks that people have been embedded in? And is a certain amount of oscillation, for example, a predictor of what you're able to do in the current network configuration? And does that affect the way that these attention allocation strategies play out? Um, as I'm just trying to spitball the answer, I guess what I would assume would be that if that were true and that you'd been, you'd been in a network, you had developed some deep domain knowledge, now you're in a brokerage position that maybe you don't need to, um, maybe dividing attention still allows you to do the interrogation mode rather than simply the recombination mechanism that we described because you've got the context and you have the understanding to be able to unpack that information in a deep way. Does that? Last question, Jen. Thank you. Uh, so I really enjoyed this and I actually have a methodological question as well, essentially on the other factor. Um, and at the core, it has to do with the fact that your primary DV was the goodness of ideas assessment mm -hmm. of these senior VPs, yep. which first I think is just fun and ironic that they disliked the most, the ideas of people most like them, right? Because of this negative correlation between tenure and, and, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, how much fun. they like the ideas. That's so that's just that. fun. I just want to write it like that's kind of funny to me. Um, but I was wondering in terms of constraint and tenure, if there was any relationship between those two variables, because if there is, that could be really interesting. Yeah, we didn't see a relationship between tenure and constraint. There was between, or sorry, hierarchy con and constraint or tenure and constraint? Well, tenure, because you specifically said, right, that that was related to how the VPs related goodness of, rated goodness of ideas. And because goodness of ideas is related to constraint, I was wondering if there was a relationship between tenure and constraint. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember. So we ran, 
I don't remember off the top of my head, and I because apologize. I should have brought more slides. If those were interacting in yeah. terms of driving how the DV was actually, um, yeah, how that, yeah. How that actually came out. I know in um, a couple of BERT studies, there is a high correlation between tenure and constraint negative. Um, that, that was kind of my presumption. Yeah, and I think that that was also true here, but don't quote me on that. It could be interesting to explore. Just yeah, that's a great, great point. All right. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.